Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's really good to see everybody today. Well, virtually anyway. Um, hope everyone is doing well. I think well, quite a few of us have probably been working uh, virtually right now and are joining uh, from home or uh, from wherever we're sitting right now. Um, but welcome to the late spring because it's officially summer DSM Tug virtual meetup. And uh, we have a, a two really awesome presenters today um, from outside of Des Moines. Uh, we have, I'll go ahead and hop on our agenda here. Um, oops, we're not. Uh, we, we have uh, Jim uh, Denner from um, the Nashville area. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about the Tableau forums. Uh, he's a, uh, a Tableau ambassador. Uh, and also diving into order of operations, which you hear me talk about all the time, almost at every single tug meeting. Um, order of operations is very important, and he's going to give us a really, really good look at that today. And uh, Bridget Cogley is going to dive into dashboard design uh, with us. Um, and at the very end, uh, I've got just a few announcements um, uh, related to uh, some Tableau um, news and different things um, that we just kind of need to keep in mind as we move along here through uh, the next few meetings, which are probably going to be virtual. But first we have our quote of the day. And uh, cool. quote of the day, uh, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite quotes um, because you get a, a big database and you, all you see is the numbers and it's, sometimes it's hard to see the patterns and you don't see the story in the data until you build that picture with it or dashboard. Um, in the day that used to be bar charts and you know, all we'd get is bar charts and maybe we'd get our um, no skew lines and, and bell curves, but now it's so much more with Tableau and, and other Viz tools. So sometimes we get in there and we can see something unexpected, uh, which then we can dive into a little more. The story gets more interesting when that pops up. Um, but now we're going to jump into our first presentation with a presenter with Jim. Um, I'm going to post these slides afterwards, probably uh, in Tableau in the community, and I'll probably uh, tweet out a link as well, uh, push out links to that uh, everywhere we can everywhere we have contact points with you. Um, but more about Jim. Uh, Jim is a three-time Tableau Forum ambassador and he's helped literally thousands of Tableau community users. He's probably helped me at some point. Um, his professional career has been focused in retail and consumer products industries. Um, he's basically um, really awesome in the BI area and still consults uh, part-time when he's not being a triathlete. Um, his blog is focused on intermediate Tableau user-ready progress um, beyond just getting started. Um, and his Tableau public site um, supports the blog and also includes detailed how-to examples um, for more uh, in-depth uh, Tableau techniques. So you get more information to, to really dive in and, and get things moving in your dashboards. Uh, Jim's lives in the Nashville area where he's active in the tug there and he presents Tableau to undergrad and graduate level business analytics students. And Jim, I'm gonna pass this off to you. And go ahead. Okay. Let me just get this started and uh... Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as Michelle indicated, my name is Jim Daner, and I am uh, one of the Tableau uh, Forum ambassadors. Uh, if you don't know anything about the ambassador program, now is the right time to learn because nominations are now open for this next year. Uh, when it comes to forum ambassadors, there's about 40 of us around the world who are uh, have been granted, have been given the opportunity to be forum ambassadors. We are. Uh, we get that on an annual basis and uh, the nominations come from users like you and from, uh, you know, from people out in, uh, out in Tableau Public. The actual uh, election comes is determined by uh, the staff in, uh, in Seattle. 
I've been a forum ambassador for three years, uh, hope to be one for four years. Uh, we'll see what happens at the end of next month. As mentioned, I do live uh, in Nashville, and if you know Nashville at all, Nashville is a wonderful place to live, but that's not the Nashville I live in. This is the Nashville that I live in. I live 30 miles outside of Nashville, and that's not my house by any means, but uh, I live out in the, uh, out in the country, and the, the guy right down the street has 100 head of black Angus cattle. So uh, uh, Nashville uh, gets rural in a, in a hurry. In terms of background, my background is primarily as an engineer and as a marketing uh, person. I do not have an IT background. So some of the things I'm gonna talk about today, particularly the order of operation, uh, come second nature to, uh, uh, you know, to people with an IT background, but not everybody really understands the order of operation. Uh, just a quick mention about the Tableau community and the forum, and I'm going to let you in on a little something very soon, in the very near future, this Tableau public page is going to change. So uh, come out to uh, the uh, Tableau community page, and when you come out to the community page, this is your portal where you can find out about what your tug group is doing or uh, e-learning uh, opportunities. My favorite place here comes off the community tab right here, and it takes you out to the forum. The forum is the place where you go to get help. I don't know, uh, Michelle said I might have answered some of her questions. Maybe some of you have had questions answered just very simply by a guy, by a guy named Jim. Well, I'm Jim, okay, and I've literally uh, answered thousands of questions over the three years. If it's your first trip out to the uh, 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 to the forum, we'd ask that you stop and go to the uh, getting started page because it's, it's going to give you uh, hints, tips, and best practices so that you get the most out of your visit. And we'd also ask before you post a question that you take a moment and use the search engine to see if your question has already been asked. Every question that's been asked is out there in the database. And you can pull it up and see if the question's been asked, answered, and you've already got your answer. But if you, feel, if you still feel like, well, now I really got to ask my own question, by all means do. Uh, we clearly want you to do that. Ask you to do a couple of things though. Please be concise, clearly state the question, give us an idea of what you expect the results to do, and please include your TwibX workbook. It makes it so much easier to communicate back and forth. We understand that sometimes data sensitive, just include a few lines of dummy data just so we can see what the problem is. Today, we're gonna to focus on the order of operations. It's gonna take about 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna go through the 10 steps of the order of operation, relatively high level, but we're gonna uh, dive into a couple of them so that, uh, so that we can, can all understand what's going on. If you're not familiar with the order of operation, that is the sequence that Tableau goes through as it creates your viz. You start with a data source. It could be a flat file, it could be uh, an uh, Excel worksheet, or it could, it could come out of your, uh, uh, your ERP system or, or some uh, you know, public database that you brought into Tableau. And as you go through the order of operation, the first thing uh, you're going to do is create a dimensional table that, under, uh, that underlies each one of your individual worksheets. And that dimensional table kind of looks like an Excel spreadsheet. At least you can think of it that way. It's made up of rows and columns. It, it's not really of that same structure, but if you think of it that way, it's gonna help with the rest of the, the, rest of the discussion. Once that dimensional table is, uh, is laid out, then you add values to that table and create either a text table, a graph, a chart, or whatever, whatever vis you, uh, you wanna include. I like to look in the order of operations in three, seg three segments. The first two segments are, I'm sorry, I have to do something there. There, there was something on the screen that was in the, in the way for me. Uh, I like to look at it in three segments. The first two segments are workbook level filters. They limit the amount of data that actually gets into the workbook. The next eight, steps in the order of operation, create the table that underlies your individual worksheet, and then it add values into the table. Let's take a look at those first two uh, all at once here. Those are extract filters and data source filters. Those can be found on the data source tab, and in the upper right hand corner, 
you'll find a place where you can add or edit filters. To add a filter, you simply add the filter, a box will open, and at that point you can select the dimension or measure that you want to filter by, and another box will open. And this begins to look an awful lot like filters that you, you, you're used to. And you can select the data that you want to include in the workbook. Now, the one thing to remember, the things that you filter out, that data is no longer available to you in the workbook. But by reducing the size of the overall data set in the workbook, you're vastly going to improve the performance of your, uh, uh, of your workbook. Now, the next three levels include context filters, the creation of sets, fixed LODs in top end, and that's followed by dimension filters. These three steps are where you create the dimensional table that underlies your individual worksheet. Context filters are the first part of that. Very simple to create. You just drag your measure or drag your dimension to the filter tab, open up the filter tab, and add the dim dimension to context. We're going to spend a moment here and go into detail to see what context filters do to the set formation and fixed LOD and top end calculations. And to do that, I want to look at a very simple table. We have two different, we've got fruits and vegetables. We've got three different types of fruit, two types of vegetables. And what I'd like you to remember and think about here is that the total for fruit is $5.75 and the total for vegetables is $2.63. And the top three items are apples, bananas, and green beans. And let's see what happens when we start using context filters with this very simple LOD. We're gonna take a look at fixed type the total cost, what's the sum of the total cost. And we create a simple biz, I bring produce to the filter, the filter shelf, and I filter out bananas. But produce is not in context. And when I do that, the total is still $5.75. The filter for produce and the filtering out of bananas was done after the LOD was calculated. Now, on the other hand, if I put produce in context and filter out bananas, then the bananas will be filtered out before, before the LOD is calculated and the total will come out $3.75. We often have users come in and they ask, they'll ask a question, how could I get Tableau to ignore this filter? Well, you don't get Tableau to ignore a filter. It, it doesn't do things randomly. You as a designer decide when you want the filter applied and when you don't want it applied. And by applying the filter before the LOD is calculated, you'll get the total recognizing the filter at $3.75. Let's see what happens to uh, the top end calculation. In this case, what we're going to do is I've got a filter on type and I'm gonna filter out vegetables. And at the same time, we're going to look for the top three values. Now, if you remember, we th the top three were apples, bananas, and green beans. Okay. If I do not put type in context, the, the top end, the top three, will come back with only two items, apples and bananas. And that's because the third item was the third item, green bean, was filtered out after the top end was calculated when we filtered out vegetables. If we, put, if we put type in context, now we'll get three values, but those three values will be apples, bananas, and grapes. Because we filtered the entire vegetable category out before we calculated the top end. So you can see how where you, what you put in context and where you put it in context will affect the value that you get in your LOD calculations, your set formations, and also your top end. The fifth step in the order of operation is the application of dimension filters. And I know you're all familiar with this. This is one of the first things you learn how to do. You just apply the filter, select what you want to leave out, and in this case, the corporate values get filtered out of the data. Dimension filters also can be placed on a continuous uh, dimension. 
like we did with the order date. Here we use a relative date filter where we're only going to look at six months worth of data or a range filter where you can select the dates. And it's, it's further limiting the amount of data that's in that underlying table. Well, if you take a look at the first five steps in the order of operation, we've gone from a relatively large data set. And if you're familiar with the superstore data that came with your, uh, your copy of Tableau, it has about 10,000 rows of data in there. And by applying filters and extract filters and data source filters, and then going through the context and dimensional filters, the data that's actually underlying that worksheet is limited to 150 rows. So we've gone from a very large data set to a very small manageable data set. But once again, that's the only data that's available for you to use on that specific worksheet. Now the final five steps in the order of operation put values in that, in that data table. And this is where you can start thinking of that data table like your Excel spreadsheet. You've got the rows defined, you've got the columns defined, and now we're going to put the numbers and we're going to put the values into that worksheet. The sixth step is where data blending occurs. And we're going to talk about data blending. And I will say this, I, with uh, the adoption of 2020.2 and uh, data relationships, the whole idea of blending changes a little bit, but the order of operation does not. That, uh, that action will take place in step, uh, in step six. And the last, uh, the last four uh, steps uh, actually play with the values and change the values uh, in the data table. Let's talk about data blending for just a second. Data blending is when you take two different data sources and you take data from your secondary source and bring it into your primary source. The blended data, the data from the secondary source, always comes in at an aggregate level. And it's aggregated at the level of the link. Okay, And that will remain the same even with the new data re uh, re relationships. It just happens in a little different fashion. Now, because that happens in the sixth step, there's some things that are no longer available. For example, LODs that were calculated at the fourth step or top end that was calculated at the fourth step are no longer available to you. They, you've already gone past that step in the order of operation. And any filtering can only take place at the level of the link. Now, personally, I'm not, a, I'm not too much of a fan of data blending. And I tend to, tend to use it only as a last resort. I tend to join, uh, join files together or union files together, and I do anything I can to avoid blending data. For these very reasons, I, I, I tend to overuse uh, LODs. Now, the, the next step in the order of operation brings in the last two members of the LOD family. That's include and exclude. If you think about LODs, uh, about 80% of the LODs that you would write will be of the fixed variety. The remaining of the remaining, 15% of the remaining will be in the include, and the final 5% will be in the exclude uh, variety. You're now working with the values that are in the data table. We're no longer working with dimensions. And include allows you to, to take into account dimensions that are not actually shown in the viz in your calculation. Okay. Imagine you're a product manager and you want to know what the average sale is per, you, uh, uh, per product in your product line. If I just simply write a uh, simple average and just drag quantity uh, to the viz and, and uh, let it uh, aggregate with average, the average in sports comes out at 12.3 for my simple, my simple uh, data set here. But that might, not be the, that might not be the answer that I was looking for. I mean, as a product manager, do I really care about color at this point? I'm more interested in, for my individual customer, what was the average, average number of products that he bought in my, in my two products in the product line? Well, by writing the statement as include product, some quantity, we'll bring the dimension product into the calculation so that I get the average at the product level of 24.5 or 31 uh, or 31 for toys for my, uh, for my individual customers. Very different answer, but we were able to do that because, because of using the include statement. Exclude takes a look at dimensions that you've already got in your, uh, in your viz. You've already placed them, already placed them uh, uh, in the visual itself and excludes them in the calculation. 
to see how that works, uh, I've taken Superstore data here, and I've, I've taken a look at sales at the state level, but I also want to look at what was the total for each region, each one of the four regions. Uh, to do that, we write a statement that says exclude state. We're going to exclude the state from this calculation, total the sales, give me the sum of sales. And it gives us a value in the Western region of $725,000, which is the same for each state throughout the region. And at the same time, I can see the value of the sales in each individual state. So include, we'll take, we'll include the effect of dimensions that are not shown in your, in your bids. Exclude takes dimensions that are shown in your bids and takes them out of the equation. The eighth step is when we use, uh, when we filter on the individual measures. We're now looking at the actual data that's in the table itself. And measure filters come in two different varieties. You can filter at the row level or you can filter at the aggregate level. When you add, add the dimension to filters, like here we drag quantity to filters, a box is gonna open up and it's gonna give you a choice of how you wanna aggregate or how you, want to, uh, how you want to filter. This top entry here, all values, allows you to filter at the row level. What this does is we're taking a look and we're, I want to see all the values at 15 units or less, and it filters out any value that was greater than 15. I could also, when I drag that to the filter shelf, let it aggregate, the default aggregation is sum, but I could use average or median or, or any of the other aggregations. And the same calculation, I want to see everything less than 15, is now looking at the sum of values less than, less than 15. You get very different answers, but that's how, that's how measure filters can either work at the row level or they can work at the aggregate level. Grand totals can be found on, it's a ninth step, and it can be found on the analytics tab. Simply drag the total pill to the shelf and decide whether you want to apply to subtotals, column totals, or row totals, okay? If, you, if, you're, used to a, if you're used to using uh, totals in Excel, you're actually identifying which cells you want to add up and totaling it at the bottom of your uh, at the bottom of your spreadsheet. Uh, Tableau totals work differently than that. They're they're in a separate module. They're in a module all by themselves, and the total is being taken taken based on the filters that you've applied on your uh, on your bids itself. Now the default aggregation for totals is sum, but you can change that as long as you're using a uh, you know a simple dimension. All you have to do is open up. The pill itself. Right click on the uh, right click on the pill. Scroll down to total using, and then you can select how you want that aggregation uh, made. Uh, in this case, I've taken uh, the aggregation, and I want to see this. I want to see the average, even though the individual items are summed together. Now, not all aggregates can be uh, can be totaled using uh, using the grand total tail. And uh, I'm going to get into this a little bit better, a little bit more when we talk about, uh, uh, about uh, table calculations. But very often we'll get a question where they want to see the aggregate at the, uh, they want to see the grand total line, and they want it on some aggregate that they've created. Here we've, we've calculated our uh, values across the column so we can get totals across the column, but we can't get them, we can't get them down the rows. The last item are, uh, in step 10 are table calculations. And I want you to think of that Excel spreadsheet again, because this is really getting back to how you, uh, how you would navigate and how you would operate on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. Very similar. Uh, to, to use the table calculation, uh, simply drag your uh, measure to the marks card, open up the marks card, Scroll down to quick table calculation, and there's a number of predetermined calculations. This one is percent of total, but you can do year over year calculation, percentile calculations. There's a variety of them, or you can write your own. Now, the thing to remember about table calculations is they always result in an aggregate. 
and uh, they can either be calculated across the columns or down the rows. And you can determine that by opening it up, opening up the calculation and editing so that you're going across or down. I want to take a look at a couple of specific ones here. Uh, this first one's just very simply creating a running sum of sales and it's going down the rows. So as the running sum of sales, each one of these values is the sum of uh, the, it's, it's accumulating as you go down the table so that when you get down to the bottom, the total is the total for the entire column. You can also nest table calculations and this one does nothing more. This is the year over year calculation. I'm going to take a look at the value in uh, the current cell and I'm going to subtract from it the value in the, the uh, past cell. And uh, that, and we're actually looking at the running sum. So you can see that the difference in these two columns was $18,000 for accessories. And by the time we get down to the total, it's $124,000. Now, one of the questions that comes up quite often is that uh, users want to determine the rank or they want to determine the, the, the position of uh, one of the products in the product line, but they want to vary it by a number, a, a number of different dimensions. And to do that, you can, you can take an LOD and you can rank and you can use that LOD inside a table calculation because table calculations are the last in the order of operation. Everything, all the calculations that you've made above uh, the table calculation can be used uh, as, as, a, uh, uh, as a measure inside the, uh, inside the table calculation. Uh, this just simply says, uh, take every combination of subcategory, segment, and year, and total the sales at those levels and set them aside so I can use them later. And when we get down to the 10th step, when later arrives at the 10th step, I want to rank those uniquely and I want them in descending order. So by doing this, you can see that here in uh, telephones, for example, in 2018, in the consumer category, we're ranked third, they were ranked fourth in corporate, they were ranked first in home office, but then in 2019, they were ranked first, fourth, and first in home office. There's one other, uh, there, actually, there's five other uh, table calculations that are used to navigate across the table and around the table. And this is very similar to the offset function that you'd have inside, a, uh, uh, inside an Excel spreadsheet. First and last are defined either the first position or the last position in a row or a column. Rows going, uh, rows going across, columns, uh, I'm sorry, rows going down, column, and columns going across. First plus one is the second position. Last minus one is the second last position. Index is uh, simply a counter down each of the rows or each of the columns. And you can do that inside, uh, inside partitions within the data set. Previous value simply returns the value, uh, the previous value of the same calculation. And lookup is very useful because this is the one that's very similar to uh, offset in uh, Excel, where if you're at a current location in, uh, in your table and you want to go up one, you go up, minus one would be up, minus two would be up two, minus three would be up three, or minus one would be one to the left, plus one would be one to the right. Those are the five, uh, the five navigators navigation calculations that you have in, uh, in table calculations. I know that was kind of quick going over, uh, going over the order of operations, but it's the order of operations that determine, as you go down the order of operation, it determines how you created that table that underlies your biz, the data that's in that table and how your biz works out. As noted before, uh, I keep a, uh, I have a blog that's, uh, that I call See It Your Way. Uh, this is where the blog is located. The blog is really aimed for uh, users who are in that intermediate state. Uh, you're past getting started and you're beginning to feel pretty good about, uh, good about uh, knowing how Tableau works. I also keep a uh, Tableau public site 
where there's many downloadable workbooks and I can be reached at Market Analytic Friday. Thank you very much. Okay, if they... uh, I've got a couple of questions here for you, Jim. Okay, go for it. Okay, uh, the first one is from Kyle and he wants to know if he's able to use parameters to change level of detail. Ram uh, excellent question, Kyle. I'm glad, uh, uh, seriously, I'm glad you asked that because we, we get a lot of questions about parameters. Parameters are nothing more than a way that a user can input a single static value into Tableau. And once you've got a value, yes, you can use, uh, you can use that value in a number of different ways. Uh, that value can be text and you can use it uh, to define what measures you're going to look at or navigate, in, uh, navigate around in Tableau, or it could be a value. But you think, think of a parameter as nothing more than a value that you're going to put in any uh, formula and you'd use it just like the value that you would put in the formula. You'd use it in place of that value. Okay. Um, and we have a second question from uh, Josh. Uh, will you improve your biz performance by doing the first two filtering steps in prep or does it matter? Uh, good question. Uh, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if, if you think about uh, what we just saw, once the data is in Tableau, that's, that's, and it's inside your workbook. That's what's going to determine what your performance is. If you take it out with a data source filter in the first two steps, or you take it out in prep, you've accomplished the same thing. Uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, you become really, really good at prep and, and come back and put in a, uh, uh, do a demonstration in prep, because I want to see that. Uh, prep is not my cup of tea. But I, I do kind of know my way around it, but uh, yeah, yeah, prep uh, prep is a very good tool for for uh, cleaning data and getting ready to go into Tableau. Okay, great, thank you, Jim. Um, let me get my screen up here again. All righty, uh, our next presenter is uh, Bridget Cogley, and um, Bridget actually started her. Uh, Tableau journey as an um, American Sign Language interpreter, and she became an analyst. And she has an interdis interdisciplinary approach to data analytics. Um, she has dynamic, engaging presentation style, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but she also um, brings a lot to the conversation re regarding um, ethics and data visualization linguistics. Um, I've always enjoyed watching her present every time I've seen it. Um, so you're in for a, a really uh, big treat here with uh, Bridget presenting to us on this. Um, she also presents on using color and um, just a whole broad array of uh, different topics within Tableau. Um, but I thought dashboard design might be a good one to pair with order of operations because it does impact how things show up in your biz. So. Um, well, without further ado, I'll pass this over to Bridget. Uh, okay, there you go. Perfect, thank you so much. So I've got my presentation in Tableau. So this is kind of, um, as mentioned before, I'm a Tableau Zen master, four-time Tableau Zen master. I started my career as an American Sign Language interpreter. And so somehow I went on this big long journey where I went through kind of a startup business and became an analyst. And one of my key focuses is on dashboard design. And so this presentation kind of comes from a journey that I went on. So some of it was really trying to understand how to build dashboards that require less explaining, far less rework, and also improve the usage. And that to me is how I define a better dashboard. And so what I'm gonna to present to you is not rules, but four big ideas. And so we'll talk about them more. We'll explore these a bit more, but the key ideas are setting the tone, going from large to small, answering a single question. This is probably the most commonly known one, and then moving beyond the chart. But first I'm gonna take you kind of way back, if you will, to the journey I went on. And I suspect that many of you have also gone on. And that is that you take Tableau, you throw it on here, you make these dashboards. Sometimes you sit here and kind of fidget with it. And so this was my journey. I went through and it's like, okay, well, where, you know, how do I get this to look better? How do I make this more usable? You know, I might play with spacing this way. 
um, eventually, you know, we get to a point where it's like, hey, we can put things in containers and that helps us line things up. And containers are great. And then we go from there and we learn that we can start floating our legends. So then that takes up less space. So we're not stuck in container world. We've got some area where we can start floating the legends and putting things in a little bit more strategic spot. And then we get to the pretty stage where we are going to make this beautiful. We're going to find magnificent colors. We're gonna really pull up our brand. Um, sometimes there's a lot of colors when we get to this pretty stage. And once we get there, you know, we kind of go, okay, great. You know, we've went on this whole journey of building a better dashboard. Now what? And I know this because that was my story. And so, you know, starting in 2015, I went on this really long journey to understand data visualization. Um, I went through a very linguistic lens. I went through a lot of very obscure definitions to really understand that. Good news for you, this is not that presentation. That presentation is out there, it's TC16's talk. So if you want to get the real deep dive academic version of this talk, it's out there, it exists. <laughs> what we're going to do instead is really focus on those four big ideas. And so my first one is I'm actually gonna let you participate and play in. So I'm going to let you look at this room and think how you would describe it to somebody who can't see it. You don't have to answer, but just think about, okay, I've got this room. I'm going to start explaining it to somebody else. I do this live and I love this kind of test because I always ask people, where did you start? What was the first thing you mentioned? And when I look at the data, I mean, we're Tableau people. Come on, we got to look at the data. About 50% of people end up at the table, 35% end up at the window, 10% go right to the lights, and then 5% go somewhere else. Here's what's really interesting to me. Almost nobody says that it's a conference room. Now, there is a language bias to this. Certain languages actually force you to say that this is a conference room, American Sign Language being one of them. And so with that, I'm going to present you four big ideas again. And a part of that setting the tone when we look at that room is saying, hey, I've got a conference room. I'm going to go from the largest object, the table, to the window, to so forth. The question answering, what is this room? And also, I'm going to recognize it's not just the furniture that make the room. It's the entire atmosphere of the room. So all those pieces come together to make the room. So going back to this idea of the dashboard, I want to reset that tone. I want to revisit that same dashboard that I looked at multiple times, but this time I'm going to look at look, feel, and flow. And I'm going to try to provide more context to somebody using that dashboard. I went ahead and did a little bit of Julia Child here. So my kitchen's a bit of a mess. That is intentional. I want you to kind of focus more on where I start moving these pieces. And I'm also going to turn this notice off. A lot of times I will completely live build this, but we are going to do a quick Julia Child treatment. And so a part of what I'm doing, and one of the reasons why I personally like floating, is that I'm able to move things around and organize them easier in my analytical process. It's not the only right way, it's a way that I've found to be very useful and helpful for me. And so this is one way as I start organizing this dashboard, you see that I'm starting to think about how these items fall into place. Um, I may move this legend over here, and then I'm going to start moving things around and playing with it. Again, I mentioned we're going to do a Julia Child treatment with this. So I'm actually going to jump ahead to the final product. And so what you can see here is I've done some small branding. I've kind of re-highlighted the title. I've also pulled in my KPIs with the title. This is just a text box. It is set at one pixel. It's got some color. That is all that line is. And so what that does is it makes you believe that this is a single entity. I've got kind of my primary chart here that's answering my question over time. I've got a map. Um, I've got all of these items color coded in a way that it's not offensive but it gives you some context. So that is kind of how we set the tone there. And so I wanted to kind of highlight that one. When we think about this idea of large to small, you want to take, and very similar to good writing, you want to take this main idea, you want your supports, and then you want to get into details. Another term I typically use for this approach is faceting, and yes, you'll notice the golden ratio. <coughs> 
And so a lot of times when I'm exploring the data, it's something, it looks something like this. I'll do a lot of small multiples. Understand, <coughs> pardon me, my data. And I'll kind of look at it and see, is there any patterns in the data? And for somebody like me, this can be a useful view. It can also be very, very difficult to follow if I'm not intimately associated with this data. So one thing I've got here is a deeper look into the temperatures in my house. I'll let you in on a secret. Right now, my living room is extraordinarily hot. Um, so that's the room I'm in, unfortunately. <clears throat> and you can see that when I did this analysis and I took actual temperatures from my house, my master bedroom, this was during the winter, was 70 degrees, whereas certain other rooms, such as my office, were 65 degrees. Now in the winter, I want to be warm and toasty. Um, so my best place to work at that point would be the master bedroom. And so you can see where I'm starting with this high level question, where do I want to work today? <laughs> And so I can click down on this and begin exploring down. And so you can see once I've got this high level question of what's the average temperature, then I can start rolling down to, you know, day by day. What does it look like by time? Obviously for this type of an analysis, I care most about daytime, but then I'm also going to maybe look at evening and overnight and so forth as I start digging into this data. The final piece is you can see where I've called out my comfort zone. If I go to my office, you can see my office generally is not very comfortable, at least in the winter. So this is an example of that faceted approach. I start with that high level, I work my way down to the point in which you are actually at the level of individual readings. You can also see how this quickly intersects with that idea of a simple question. So I'm starting with one question. I've got a short answer. I'm going to then expand on that answer. You saw that already. But then I'm also going to start digging into what next? What other areas should I think about? And my key here is clarity. I want others to go on this very controlled adventure. And so here's an example of an analysis I did that's optimized for mobile. And so I started out with, if I'm doing a shipment analysis, I want to know how many items I've processed, how many different products did it represent, what's my average shipping time, and then were there any discounts? Because discounts in my business are going to be bad. Maybe I don't want to give that many discounts. And then you can kind of get a feel, oh, pardon me, for how this flows by day. Again, since this is optimized for mobile, you can see that I've got some really chunky bars and then we get into more individual product readings. So again, you can see I'm answering the question around shipping. If I click on these items, I get a nice exploration that's comparing them. So I can really begin seeing the difference of each individual one in contrast to the others. And so particularly for mobile, really makes it a nice easy flow through as I begin exploring this dashboard. Because again, if I'm doing shipping, it's very likely that somebody within the warehouse may be looking at this. I may be yelling about this one product that took a little too long. The final piece, and this is to me, I think, the hardest piece to get because when I show it, that's where I typically get a lot of people gasping. And this is this idea of exploring, building, refining, but really integrating our charts. So moving beyond, I have one chart for each item, thinking more about how do we build things together. So I've already kind of pre-cooked this visualization and I'm focused on product localization in this particular visualization. <laughs> And the question I'm trying to understand is that should every state have the same product? This dashboard makes me both happy and sad. I'll, I'll give you that. Because at the end of the day, I really do find out that Ohio is not going to have a store by the end of this. But I want to kind of highlight where as I start pulling in trends and where I start kind of highlighting the different items, historically, I may have left these bits separate. But maybe as I bring them in and really think about where they go together, so I've got kind of a bar chart to understand where they make a distribution. But instead of separating them, what I might do is let them be together. And so you can see where I've got these and then maybe I'll throw in my labels as well. So that way they're labeled, but it's all kind of integrated parts and pieces. And I'm also going to just send this right to the back 
and kind of play with spacing. And so that's one area where I can kind of start making pieces more integrated. And what this does is it reduces my need for this legend. I can get rid of this legend and instead really let the data shine forward. It's one of those ways to kind of bring forth the analysis. The other thing is I've got this big title bar and I know people are gonna look at it. And one thing I might do is go ahead and use that and put a chart right in there just to give people an idea. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to a tidier version of this just so you can see what it looks like once you've spent a little bit of time shining it and really optimizing it for an end user. You can start to see where you can really tidy things up, make it very easy to access, but then also really create a very polished looking product. And then I'll kind of jump into this last piece. Again, it's a very similar visualization to the one you saw before. Um, again, the difference is I played with the mobile and I did a couple tricks to optimize it for mobile, such as putting in finger bands um, and really thinking about spacing. So putting in different places where if I'm scrolling on a device with touch, I'm less likely to create an accidental filter or blip on a p data point. So these are some extra considerations I put in just for mobile. But you can see where a lot of these rules really flow together. As I set the tone, you start to understand what these visualizations are about. I'm going from a large to small. I'm really focused on answering a single question, but I'm also looking to move beyond the chart. I'm really trying to make this very accessible. And so the final part to this that really hammered this home to me was I decided to ask myself at one point, what would the dashboard of the future look like? And I spent a bunch of time really just playing and trying to solve what was in my mind, because you, you look at Tron, you look at Guardians of the Galaxy, and they have these awesome dashboards on glass. And it's like, you know, why are they always black? Why are they always these colors? Why are they always, you know, so abstract? <laughs> and so I had to play with it. And so this is ultimately what I came up with. And yet even this, follows those same rules. Even though I'm not necessarily following a Z reading pattern, your eye is more likely to go to this pie chart. And I've kind of got my retention in an abstract manner highlighted here. I'm directing you to the timeline. I've got red also taking you to degrees. I've got a section on employee feedback. And then you can begin understanding distribution. So even this is going from that thesis of large to small in an abstracted order. This also sets the tone. I've made it black. I've used very specific colors that we associate with the future. And I do have an example of this where I played with the colors. Um, and then you can see where I'm answering a single question. And my question is really, how is my business doing from an HR standpoint? And I can start digging into this and actually getting answers, even from something that's highly abstract. So I can start seeing distribution of where people have maybe traveled too much, um, I can also start digging into the more normal version. So I've got a more normal iteration of this to where you can see it's less abstract. It's still got a lot of, yes? I don't, I don't think you're showing uh, what you're talking about. I will fix that. That definitely makes it hard. So I will share this. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So this is the HR dashboard. And so you can see where your eye is more likely to go right to this big middle spot. And you can see I've got kind of a donut chart just giving you that it's 16% turnover. You can see kind of the overtime patterns that I drag you towards. If you flow through here, you can kind of get a sense for this employee feedback. Again, setting the tone, really matching the colors. I can use this to actually explore the data and kind of understand what's going on. And then I can also play with this and start seeing kind of degree makeup. So, I mean, even as abstract as it is, there is still a lot of insight to be found. The more normal version of this is kind of something, and I, I have done very similar work to this even with clients where I've had, you know, okay, I'm gonna start with this type of framing. I'm gonna allow you to use set actions to explore the data. Um, so all of these items are here. So you can kind of take this idea of this really extreme design and really even play with it here. 
So this is kind of that quasi-normal. Now I promised you the business look. I'm going to hop over to public and I will share my screen just in one moment now that I know. <laughs> And so with the idea of setting the tone, I'm going to reshare. And so I can see here what happens when I take away the dark background, when I really focus on, hey, I'm going to make it more business appropriate colors. A, I had to take a lot of color out. Um, it was very distracting, but B, this doesn't feel as futuristic to me. So when I look at this versus the original, the original felt very futuristic. This feels abstract, but not necessarily futuristic. And so that's kind of where those four big ideas come into play for me is really setting those, that tone, going large to small, answering a single question, but really thinking beyond the chart. And I think once you hit that point of thinking beyond the chart, you really can do whatever you want. And so that is this presentation. <laughs> and you'll find a lot more of my work available on the Tableau Public. Um, you, you saw a highlight of it, and there's certainly more. I blog a lot over on Tableau Fit. I've got a lot right now on color. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. You. It was very awesome as usual. Um, some of that I remember seeing uh, you present my very first Tableau conference I saw yes. you present, so <laughs> it's kind of stuck in my mind. Um, I'm going to jump back into my slides here. Oops. Hold on. Ah, okay. The computer stopped to um, yell at me there a little bit. And there we go. Okay. Um, so as we wrap up here today, a uh, big thank you to both Bridget and Jim for uh, taking the time to uh, share their knowledge with us on Tableau. Um, I always learn something new when I see either one of them present. Uh, so it's always always fun for me to, to see what they're speaking about and what they're presenting on because there's always something new for me. Um, for now, um, our tug is going to be staying virtual. Um, some of this um, is just because a lot of the venues that we might normally use um, are not allowing large groups to to be there, but I think for the safety of all of us for the time being, we're just gonna keep these meetings virtual for now. Um, the Tableau Live virtual conference is still under planning. Um, I haven't seen um, anything come through as far as uh, when registration will open up. I believe the European conference was just last week. Um, so uh, hopefully they'll take some of the learnings from that conference and continue to build and plan for uh, the U.S. conference in the fall, assuming it's in the fall. Um, also, there's another way you can get your Tableau fix in between times, between tug meetings, uh, the DataFam Community Jam. Um, it's kind of a um, group effort between Tableau and the Tableau Fringe Festival. And um, the, they started out every week, but now they're going about once a month. Um, but lots lots jam-packed with lots of presentations. Uh, they're about two hours long. Uh, so you got to block off a stretch of time, but always worth the time. Um, I've already seen some really awesome things over the last few months. Uh, so go ahead and uh, uh, check out DataFam Community Jam. Um, and beta testing for 2020.3 has opened up. Uh, so if you're interesting in, interested in beta testing new features, uh, I encourage you to go out and uh, get involved with that. Um, it's kind of fun to go out and see the new things that uh, are coming through and are possibly coming through in the next version of Tableau. Um, you get to see it first, you get to play with it a little bit, try to break it, that's always my goal. Uh, but you also get to give feedback and that's very important uh, to the devs on the back end. Um, Kirk, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, maybe from your end? Um, I, di I did not. Thank you, though. OK. Um, we'll probably look at having the next tug meeting, I'm guessing, the next uh, two, three months. I need to circle back with Kirk on that, see uh, kind of how things are uh, 
landing locally in Des Moines uh, with our workloads. So, um, but we can look forward to that coming up. Um, and that is um, all I have for today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, this will be posted, I believe, in the next day or so um, uh, through Tableau's YouTube channel. So you'll all be able to ex uh, access that and I will send the link out to everyone as soon as I have it. Uh, with that, everybody go and have an awesome day and rest of the week. Make it a good one. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody, for attending.